Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? We're going to start. We're going to start up again with our last panel. Um, hi, I'm David Jocelyn, and I'm a member of the Committee on Globalization as well. And um, I teach art history here at the Graduate Center. And it's my particular privilege and pleasure to um, introduce Lydia H. Liu today, who will give. Um, the last talk of the, of the day. Um, Professor Liu is a scholar of comparative literature and a theorist of media and translation. She is the Won Sun Tam Professor in the Humanities and Director of the Institute of Comparative Literature and Society at Columbia. Her publications include The Freudian Robot, Digital Media and the Future of, Uncon of the Unconscious from 2010, The Clash of Empires, The Invention of China in Modern World Making of 2004, and Translingual Practice, Literature, National Culture, and Translated Modernity from 1995. Her edited volumes include Tokens of Exchange, The Problem of Translation and Global Circulations of 99, The Birth of Chinese Feminism, Essential Texts in Transnational Theory of 2013, which is a collaborative translation with Dorothy um, Co. and Rebecca Carl, as well as the first annotated edition of the 20th century uh, anarchist journals in Chinese nat uh, national justice and equity with Wan Shi Guo from 2016. Liu is a bilingual writer and is the author of the Nesbitt Code, a work in fiction in Chinese. It's interesting how many of our speakers are also writers of fiction. Um, Professor Liu's 2014 essay, The Eventfulness of Translation, Temporality, Difference, and Competing Universals, was the second essay, that, the second text that the committee read this year. Not only did her concept of translation as an event guide us through our wide-ranging discussions, but the way she links the experience of determining what human rights are or can be through the refraction of multiple translations, which has resonated, I think, with our discussions today, offered one of the most inspiring models of, as our conference put it, puts it, translating politics. So it's a real pleasure to in, um, welcome her here with the lecture titled Inaugurating Translations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, um, I wanted to thank Gary, uh, Lindsay, and the Committee on Global and Social Change for uh, bringing back uh, uh, I remember last time I was here in this room, was it was the political concept uh, conference, which w I think is related to what you have been doing. I mean, there's a certain continuity, and it's such a, a, a privilege, an honor to be here uh, to do mm, mm, the second part of my talk. <laughs> I did my first part. Um, so I, I think uh, uh, Brent, in, in his uh, uh, concluding remarks, uh, I mean, during the Q&A, uh, put some issues really in sharp focus for us. Um, exactly what are we, what do we mean when we talk about translation? Um, I have been thinking about this, and for a long time, I felt that translation studies was the least interesting field in the humanities for a long time. Uh, but then uh, there's no way that you can get around the problem. See, that's the, that's the thing. Whether you're a translator or you're reading uh, the Communist Manifesto in translation, or when, whether you're, you're, you're teaching, there's no way you can get around this. Uh, 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 the, the, the Hebrew Bible, <laughs> so how many of us uh, read uh, the Old Testament in Hebrew, right? So we're confronted with these issues all the time. But today, I wanted to uh, uh, just quickly uh, start with a, a critique. That is, uh, I'm really characterizing Characterizing translation studies, but I do feel that there, there are two models that dominate our thinking about translation. The first one is the communication model, and the second one is the theological model. Um, now, the translation model, just quickly, if we can, we can debate um, in, in during the Q and A if we have time. Uh, always ask questions about commensurability or incommensurability or some, in some other guys, linguistic reciprocity. Um, so questions are always posed between two languages, two words, um, um, and then translatable, the translatable, and the untranslatable. Uh, I just feel that whoever proposes the untranslatable, untranslatable would have to also think about what they mean by the translatable. 
because I think there's two sides of the same point. It's a, a metaphysical problem. And then um, the theological model, uh, again, came up uh, today uh, as an object of critique, uh, fidelity. Um, how, do, how do you escape that? And then uh, or what I call promise or withdraw a meaning between languages. Uh, so then things are framed in those, in those terms in translation studies. And then um, hermeneutics of translation, more sophisticated kind of approach to the theor theological problem. And it's always interpretation, interpretation, interpretation. So um, now uh, I wanted to ask, uh, I, I want to just, uh, I think uh, this conference is adding new things. And I'm sure your readings have been generating new ideas. And I think. Um, if really, we really take translation seriously, we really we need to ask some fundamental questions. For instance, I'm just asking one, there are other fundamental questions. What does translation, what does translation inaugurate? Uh, 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 okay, you, I could say a discursive event as translingual practice, or you could say a geopolitics of language, uh, a certain language seem to move uh, uh, with more difficulty than other languages so, uh, uh, as they're conditioned by geopolitics. I think some of the earlier discussions uh, also touched on this question. And then uh, uh, Brent brought up competing universals. I really wanted to focus on, on this. Um, you can think of other questions, fundamental questions that one could put to translation. Uh, so then we, we don't have to you know, repeat the same old theological argument uh, or the same old communication, you know, whether it's adequate or not, uh, where is meaning. So uh, I, uh, I uh, wrote an, an essay about translation, uh, thinking of it as event. Uh, this is the article. <laughs> Uh, you probably read, the, the, uh, um, but so I'm, I'm, I'm pushing that further. So I'm proposing that we really need to think about a, a, a number of things to, so that we can uh, think about translation uh, and the political together. So then um, uh, how do we think about them together? So in that essay, I suggest that temporality is something that we need to reconsider. Um, and then spatiality, uh, because these are, you cannot think of the political without these, right? Um, and then mobility uh, uh, in many, uh, in, in different, uh, different registers, not just words or languages, but other theories as well. And then a multiplicity. Originally, I proposed a talk called the law of multiplicity, but I thought I should be more focused on the political now. So, but these are some of the things that I brought up in the essay, but it's an essay that I wanted to, you know, I wanted to push that further. So that's why, uh, and, and then, and then uh, in, in my talk, I wanted to consider the problem of the universal and, and competing universals, uh, universals that uh, Brent uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, and so uh, um, the question of human rights, I think last time I, I did a textual reading uh, of uh, one textual moment, but this time I'm gonna uh, bring up something else in connection with human rights. Um, so the question is, what does the discursive struggle over human rights entail philosophically? Um, uh, this year I've uh, been uh, um, working on a book uh, about the post-World War II refashioning of moral thought. Uh, my goal is not to write a book about the genealogy of ideas, uh, like human rights, racial equality, global justice, but to start a new conversation about how the transformation of moral thought was made possible in the aftermath of the Second World War and to examine its world, world, worldwide impact. Um, by temperament, uh, I would rather approach ideas as objects of philosophical analysis. Uh, but by necessity, I found myself analyzing moral thought as historical pro as a historical problem. Um, it seems that one does not have a choice if one wants to understand why 
The articulation of more aspirations was so central to the geopolitics of, post, of the post-war era that it, it drew the attention and ire of diplomats, state planners, strategists, as well as moral philosophers. Uh, we, we need to keep in mind that nothing like this had happened after the First uh, World War. Japan's failed attempt to introduce a racial equality proposal at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 serves as a sobering reminder. Moral thought did not become a matter of concern for world leaders, diplomats, and government officials until after uh, World War II. Um, uh, whether one uh, attributes it to the tragedy of the Holocaust, or uh, the decline of the European empires, post-war more discourse became so pervasive and so aggressive that it competed vigorously against the realist, like real politique, uh, uh, and strategic, strategic, uh, strategic thinkers uh, um, uh, who pushed back against, against some of what they call idealistic uh, uh, slogans. Now, uh, but then I also wanted to ask, are there intellectual substances to the assertion of its universalism? I mean, along, you know, when we talk about the politics of, of an idea. Um, usually, uh, when we discuss universalism, it's always uh, brought up in connection with cultural relativism. And it's always a frame in terms of general and particular. And so, but I wanted to uh, push it in, in a different direction to ask what the discursive structure of human rights uh, is, and then to you know, analyze its legibility in translation. I'm not gonna deal with the actual textual moments of translation. I, I think I did some of that uh, at the political concept conference. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm go gonna direct the conversation in, 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 in a direction where we can ask who's universal when we're talking about human rights. Um, uh, is the idea, sorry about the typo, the idea of human rights universal um, does the Universal Declaration of Human Rights represent Western values? In the 90s, there was this uh, debate in Asia called the Asian Values Debate, uh, which basically defined itself against so-called Western idea of human rights. Uh, and there, there were other uh, uh, relativist arguments at that time. Um, I decided to take a a, a different approach to this, to really think about uh, how the competing universals worked, uh, and perhaps to take us outside the usual general particular. And so uh, I wanted to call your attention to uh, the architect of the Cold War, uh, George Cannon, quickly. So we, we, we get the sort of the, uh, um, the, the map of uh, the immediate post-war years. George Cannon uh, was the director uh, of a creator of the policy planning staff uh, under the uh, Department of State. And then he wrote a memo uh, uh, which, is, uh, which has since been declassified. Um, this memo was actually a, a document that would uh, uh, envision the future world order. Um, uh, I just take a quote on Asia. He also talks about Africa, Russia, and other Germany, and other places. So this is what he has to say. We should cease to talk about vague and, for the Far East, unreal objectives such as human rights, the raising of the living standards, and democratization. The day is not far off when we are going to have to deal in straight power concepts. The less we are then hampered by idealistic slogans, the better. Okay, so why, and uh, for a real politique, he says, we have about 50% of the world's wealth, but only 6.3% of its population. This disparity is particularly great as between ourselves and the peoples of Asia. In this situation, we cannot fail but be the object of envy and resentment. Our real task in the coming period is to devise a pattern of relationships which would permit us to maintain this position of disparity without positive detriment to our national human. He's not talking about ideology. He's not even talking about communism. 
Marxism is not the enemy. Okay, so, and so then he, he, he moves on. Uh, but it's my own belief that in our pursuance of a workable world order, we have started from the wrong end. Instead of beginning at the center, which is our own immediate neighborhood, the area of our own political economic tradition and working outward, we have started on the periphery of the entire circle on the universalistic principle of the UN and have attempted to work inward. So he was attacking the UN. So this is where universalism was in immediate uh, aftermath of uh, World War II. So who was he attacking? Okay, Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, who was the ambassador, ambassador and rep delegate of the United States to uh, uh, the UN. Um, when the United Nations was first created, world leaders agreed to complement the UN Charter with the Universal Bill of Rights. The Commission of Human Rights was chaired by Eleanor Roosevelt. It was, draft, it was tasked with the drafting of the document. When I first began my research on the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights a number of years ago, I, I was really struck by the intensity of the moral drama that burst onto the world stage. I mean, literally the stage of the UN General Assembly. Um, that, and so uh, um, the story uh, is was so interesting. The, uh, what makes this document so unique is that the discourse of human rights, racial equality, and freedom is no longer a story of the global dissemination of Western ideas to the rest of the world. Many of the impassioned debates on the fundamental principles underlying human rights and other moral ideas were conducted in Arabic, Mandarin, English, French, Russian, Spanish, and other languages often mediated through necessary translations and self-translations. And I, I say, you know, I'm not doing a book on the genealogy or history of ideas. Um, what, um, what really interests me is the struggle that produces ideas. And that struggle involved many interested parties around the world. Uh, so then, as for those of you who are not familiar, um, the uh, Bill of uh, Human Rights consists of three documents. The first one, Universal Declaration, Declaration of Human Rights, which was uh, more the, was not a legally binding uh, document they had in mind. Two other documents took a longer time. These were legally binding. Okay, so this was the International Bill of Rights, just to refresh your, your memory. Um, uh, when they were making the document, uh, they started in 1946, and they passed, adopted the document in 1948. But everybody heard about the news. UNESCO, UNESCO organized its own symposium to investigate the possibility uh, of the universal appeal of this idea. So they reached out to many thought leaders around the world, including Gandhi in India. American Anthropological Association issued a statement on human rights. Um, and they actually submitted this statement to the Commission on Human Rights. Um, well, uh, um, W.E.B. Uh, du Bois also wrote on his own to uh, the Commission on Human Rights. Uh, so everybody was uh, concerned about what this document would turn out to be, okay? So everybody had a stake, it seems. Um, what is the mo most interesting is the document uh, statement from the American Anthropological Association. So this is what they told the UN Commission. Standards and values are relative to the culture from which they derive so that any attempt to formulate postulates that grow out of beliefs or moral codes of one culture must to that extent detract from the applicability of any declaration of human rights to mankind as well. This is a very anthropological view. Right? At, fir at first, I agreed with every single <laughs> uh, point they're making. And then, especially this one, what is held to be a human right in one society may be regarded as antisocial by another people or by the same people in a different period of the history. What's wrong with this? Uh, then it will not be convincing to the Indonesian, to the African, to the Indian, to the Chinese, if it lies on the same plane as like documents of the earlier period. 
Okay, so basically, you get it. You, know, you should not do a document that will impose Western values onto other uh, societies. Okay, the world has changed after World War II. The problem is, uh, uh, then you ask the question, who were the people who were drafting the document? Then, well, serving on the Commission on Human Rights is an Indian woman who was extremely influential and uh, vocal on, on the drafting of the document. There's a Filipino dele dele delegate, um, delegate called Romulo, and then there's a Chinese uh, delegate called P.C. Chang, uh, who was the uh, uh, vice chair of the commission. And so these were not uh, so-called Western thinkers, uh, Western delegates. And then, of course, uh, you have this uh, bearded man who is uh, Hone Gassin. <laughs> Hone Gassin, very well-known uh, French uh, uh, legal authority. And he got a Nobel Prize, by the way, a Peace Prize for his work, for the work that this team did. It's just amazing. He got the, uh, and then uh, this, I got this uh, description from the Nobel Peace Prize uh, description, which has a one factual error, vice chairman, which was, of course, P.C. Chang. This is how you write out someone, you know, who is not white. Uh, um, so, uh, and he got the Nobel Prize. Uh, John Humphrey and the others are not mentioned, which is interesting. Okay, so to summarize, the UN Human Rights Commission consists of 18 member states. Um, these were the people uh, who really made a difference. Um, I'm highlighting two women who were responsible for some of the changes that it, they introduced to Article 1 of the de Declaration. And I'll give you the making, um, I'll give you two versions. The first one was the Geneva draft in uh, 47. And then the draft finally adopted in 48. Okay, look at Article 1. All men are born free and equal in dignity and rights, and they're endowed by nature with reason and conscience and should act toward one another like brothers, all right? So the final last one is all human beings are born free and equal, and then in the spirit of brotherhood. What happened? And it turns out uh, uh, the Indian delegate uh, um, Hansa Mita was very firm, insisting that they should not uh, uh, continue to use men, they should adopt human beings. So I'm just giving you a quick example. Um, and they introduced many such uh, uh, changes to, to the concept of human rights. Um, now, so who were the core, member, uh, uh, core members on the drafting committee? Because under the Commission of Human Rights, there, were, there was a smaller group of people on the drafting committee. And these were the uh, chair, chair uh, vice chair, secretariat, and French delegate, and Charles Malik. For those of you who don't know who Charles Malik was, he's from Lebanon, and he was uh, Edward Said's uncle, uh, who wrote about him in his memoir, uh, uh, basically uh, um, uh, expressing some ambivalences about his uncle, who turned into a right-wing uh, 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 politician. Uh, so these were the core members. Um, so uh, as you can see on the left side, that is uh, Charles Malik talking to uh, Mrs. Boltwell. All right, so I think my time is uh, running out. Uh, I'll just quickly uh, uh, recap. So this, these are the three documents they uh, worked on. Um, uh, this is the timeline, the adoption, and then in 1950, there was an unexpected event that led to the inclusion of self-determination into human rights, uh, which has been controversial. Um, for, for, for instance, uh, legal historian Brian Simpson has questioned the existence of fundamental connection between human rights and self-determination. His argument is that third world nations mobilize themselves around human rights at the UN in order to achieve the goal of decolonization. But philosophically, he sees no connection between the two. And there's another uh, legal scholar uh, uh, who used to teach um, at Columbia uh, uh, Law School, um, Louis Hankin. He complained that anti-colonialism, like the Cold War, colored the human rights covenants, and that self-determination uh, basically uh, says 
color, the human rights and <laughs> the color, and self-determination was added to the roster of human rights as an additional weapon against colonialism. Although there is no suggestion that this was a right of the individual. Okay, so, uh, and this is uh, their philosophical formulation of it, and therefore they cannot accept what uh, uh, the commission had put into uh, the final document. So my question is, how was self-determination written into human rights? Uh, it was written into human rights because in 1950, Belgium proposed to add a colonial clause to the draft covenant as they were debating the legally binding document. And it won the support of Britain, France, and United States. Not surprising, the colonial powers. Um, what was that clause? The colonial clause would exempt colonial territories from the application of the human rights covenants on grounds of cultural difference and civilizational status. It was thoroughly, thoroughly like the anthropological position, cultural relativism, all right? Uh, this is not surprising because look at this map, and this is a wonderful map that uh, Henry, uh, Hugh Tinker uh, uh, put in the back of his book uh, called Race, Conflict, the International Order. Um, so look at this map. In 1946, uh, white rule uh, basically uh, 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 covered the entire Afri Afri African continent. Um, there were only two uh, 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 countries that were not um, under white rule. Um, uh, Egypt, right? and Ethiopia. So Belgium, Italy, you know, a lot of these European, and um, France, of course, uh, were uh, concerned if the non, so-called non-self-governing peoples were to be given human rights, they would revolt, okay? So, so this was the situation. Let's look at the language. This is the proposal of the language. Colonial clause was intended to, oops, to prevent the automatic application of a convention to territories for which a signatory state was responsible and was especially justified in the case of multilateral treaties. And then he continues, he says, the rules of conduct which, as they presuppose a high degree of civilization, were often incompatible with the idea of peoples who had not yet reached a high degree of development. Uh, okay, so this was the, uh, this was one of the speeches that were made on, you know, at the general, assembly, and they were talking to each other like this. By imposing those rules on them at once, one ran the risk of destroying the very fabric of uh, basis of their society. It would be an attempt to lead them abruptly to the point which the civilized nations of today uh, had only reached after a lengthy period of time. All right, so imagine uh, the UN assembly where all these delegate, delegates uh, gathered, and so how did they re you know, repudiate this. So Ethiopia represented that the fact that certain countries were backward in connection with others, uh, in comparison with others, did not justify their exclusion from the covenant. On the contrary, the reason for their backward condition was that their population have for so long been denied the opportunity to enjoy fundamental freedoms. And I think a lot of the things that we, we do as ac academics uh, were already echoed by them. They were, they were, they were anticipating our argument post-colonial uh, scholarship. And Iraqi represent a woman, wonderful woman. She wondered how the degree of evolution of people should, could prevent it from enjoying the rights which Khone Gassan himself had admitted to be inherent in human nature. So Khone Gassan was a universalist, but sometimes he was a cultural relative. It's just not coherent. Makes no logical sense whatsoever. And they, the only sense that makes is the historical sense, the colonial historical sense. And I'll give you this. Uh, and then P.C. Zhang, who was the uh, vice chair, made this speech. A second argument centered around something that had been dignified by the name of levels of civilization. During the rapid growth of your empires in the 19th century, there had been a tendency to equate the terms imperial growth and civilization. It was then that the word native had acquired a new meaning as a designation of non-Europeans, a definition which he feared might still linger in the minds of some people because he was talking to them. Uh, it's right there. That's you guys. Uh, and then he continues. 
Civilization had largely meant European rule. A reaction to that attitude had begun to develop by the early 20th century, and after two world wars, the world ought to have a different idea of the meaning of civilization. It was true that there were different stages, technological and other forms of advancement, but as the UN Charter clearly showed that that did not mean less developed areas were to be exploited by outsiders. And this last quote is even more interesting. In a sense, colonial administration was both a burden and a blessing, apart from the sufferings of the peoples of non-self-governing territories and from the benefits accruing to the colonial powers, the latter also suffered because power corrupted them. And this was before Fanon <laughs> uh, uh, or Ashish Nandi. The United Nations should help them by ensuring that they were no longer corrupted by such power. The non-inclusion of a colonial clause in the draft convention would be a step in that direction. What I'm saying is that after uh, speech after speech, uh, finally they voted. They defeated the colonial clause. They defeated that clause on November the 2nd, and then immediately a Pakistani delegate, along with some other Asian delegates, one week later, a proposed a draft resolution, all peoples shall have the right of self-determination, which was passed the next day by the UN General Assembly. And so this is how self-determination was written into human rights. If you look at the covenants, that's why uh, some of the political scientists, the political theorists complain that, you know, why do you put Article 1 into the covenant, legal, legally binding. So all peoples have the right of self-determination. And then three, states, parties to the present um, covenant, including those who have uh, those having responsibility for the administration of non-self-governing and trust territories shall promote the realization of the right of self-determination. You don't find this language in the UN Charter or any of the earlier documents, which is fascinating. So now that completely transforms the concept of uh, human rights. Uh, so I er asked earlier, what does the discursive struggle over human rights entail philosophically? Uh, it's not that, uh, it, you know, uh, 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 it's not this, the, the kind of argument when, when, one should make along with um, a Louis Henrik, for example. Um, but then I also ask, are there intellectual substances to the assertion of its universalism? And my answer is, uh, there is a post-war transformation of a concept. I think the name of your committee is, is perfect for this, global and uh, political uh, and social change. So we really, if we take change seriously, we cannot simply look at human rights and say it's a Western idea before investigating it. So conclusion, human rights no longer a Western idea. Um, so even back in uh, 1948, there were five uh, versions that were originals. And now it has made a rec world record, 520 languages. So I'm not giving you a case because there, there are no other cases like this. And it's simply a post-war development that has had far-reaching uh, impact. So here's the... Uh, the, the, the impact. I don't have the time to talk about the Bandung moment because Bandung accepted human rights because self-determination was part of it. Uh, otherwise, they would probably not accept it um, because it was controversial. Uh, the communists were opposed at that time. And then 66, this clause was included in the legally binding documents. And it has been included in subsequent UN documents. So a very powerful transformation. And this transformation can be demonstrated uh, by comparing this map. You looked at, at uh, earlier. Territories under white rule and independent. In 1946, what does it look like 30 years later? And so uh, it certainly uh, um, these uh, third world um, intellectuals and diplomats and, and uh, world leaders, uh, leaders uh, constructed different idea of human rights. And, and that idea also helped them 
uh, mobilized for, for the cause of uh, independence, but it's not instrumentalization. I wanted to make this clear, because as you can see, you cannot instrumentalize, instrumentalize negativity. Um, and the, the, the whole uh, process shows that they were pushing back on the colonial clause. It's not that they first thought of an idea, let's do, do it with something, uh, do, 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 do something with it, right? And so um, this is how a concept got transformed. Um, it raises some meta meta methodological issues. We can't simply follow the English and say human rights has always existed. Yeah. So um, I raised the issue and through translation, through multilingual uh, negotiation, uh, a concept can be changed. And uh, this is a, a very powerful uh, demonstration of how uh, the transformation of a concept also led to the transformation of the world. Thank you very much. Thanks for that amazing talk. Really a great way to end um, the day. So questions from, from all of you. I can get us started. Um, what does this do to the idea of concepts, do you think? Um, yeah. Uh, Susan. <laughs> yes, very good question. Uh, I remember at the last conference, political concept, I, I, that, was the, that was my question. Uh, my question was exactly what is the relationship between words and concepts? And I think we, 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 we always conflate them. And we point at a word and say it's a concept. Is it? Um, so what I'm pointing out is a discursive structure. Uh, discursive structure, uh, I think I like your, I like your graphic uh, for, the, for, for this. It looks like this. A concept looks like this. Um, where did you get this image? Lindsay. Lindsay got the image. So she intuitively, she got it. So the, a concept is not a word. Uh, a concept, uh, it, it, you can imagine it uh, not as a network. I, didn't, I, I don't think it's a network either. I, I call it a discursive structure that has a temporality and spatiality. And then, uh, then even structure is too static because uh, uh, there is mobility as well. So what would be a, a, an appropriate I I image like a figure of speech that would capture this, right? Right now I'm writing a, uh, an article about word and concept, so I won't tell you what my <laughs> argument is, but basically I think it's very important to distinguish the two. Otherwise, we always do what uh, Sam Moyen <laughs> did. Uh, Sam Moyen, if you remember, remember you brought me and Sam, Sam here to debate? Sam Moyen uh, rejected uh, the established narrative that says human rights goes all the way to European natural law, right? Natural rights and all that. Sam Moyen comes in and says, no, 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 it didn't start until 77, uh, until when Carter, Carter administration started to instrumentalize that when there, there was movement. So basically, um, and then when we were here in the other room, and he used the engrams to demonstrate, you know, the frequency in which human rights <laughs> appeared. I said, no, 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 that's not the method. Because he was conflating uh, um, uh, words with concept, uh, rather than uh, analyzing a discursive, discursive structure, which would then show that thing changes happened. So human rights is not a Western idea. I, I, I can claim that. I have many. I just gave you two examples. One was the gender uh, issue. You don't find it in any of the previous declaration of, of uh, uh, rights. Any like, you, you, uh, Declaration of Independence, like you, Virginia, right? American Declaration of Independence, or the uh, Declaration uh, uh, or the Rights of Man, it's not there. 
uh, show uh, the other things like self-determination come on still not accepted by political theorists. And they say, oh, there's, you know, there's, there's no reason, reason, right? And so if you don't do an analysis of the discursive uh, structure or something, something like this, uh, then uh, you go to etymologies. You, you go to engrams. And you go to the traces that words themselves generate, which can be deceptive. So this is how I, I approach this problem of concept. And, and I'm sure there are other ways of approaching this. So I'm, uh, uh, I, I, in any case, I refuse to collapse the two. No, it makes sense, and it's great that, and I see a question, which is great, but I'll just say, um, in the spirit of synthetic thinking, um, that last night Bashir said, or quoted himself as saying, I think this is correct, that philosophy is translation. Translation is philosophy on some level. Am I right? And, you know, it's very interesting that you're kind of breaking the concept down to translation, but then there's this way in which that might be philosophy as well, but without concepts, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, you don't have to answer that, because we'll go to eat them instead, <laughs> <laughs> unless you want to. So, so I do have a question. This was great and um, eye-opening and wonderful in the way it's a, a serious um, <clears throat> contestation of, of Sam Moyne's whole trajectory of uh, the, the, the last utopia. Um, the question I have, and I'm more of a Begrifskischichte Koselekian when it comes to politics, which I think actually is amenable to what you're doing, precisely because the concepts are always political in this instance, and thus you can see the the reoccupation over time. But but I <clears throat> I'm curious because you presented it as um, an analysis of discursive strategies or semantic strategies, but actually the narrative you gave us, which was quite historical seemed more along the lines of something like an actor network theory, at least insofar as the competing understandings of the terms uh, snap together as the result of uh, particular meetings of nodes. And, and the one where it's most uh, clear is that there, there isn't an obvious reoccupation of a concept as so much as a response to it's not a happenstance, but the contingency of the colonial clause, which then provoked a response that actually then changed the semantic con the, con uh, uh, the, the, the content of what human rights would be. As you say, it's sort of an outlier that self-determination should be part of it. There's no obvious reason on the front end, but it's actually this sort of uh, network constellation that leads to the, the change, and so I'm wondering uh, how that fits into your pure, your, your <clears throat> self-described as discursive uh, uh, analysis, whether or not there aren't other uh, material and social aspects that seem to be uh, coming into the equation that, that lead to this. Uh, th does that make sense as a? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm a more of a Hegelian than a Latourian. <laughs> but what do you think? Uh, I, I think a network, uh, I, I, it, it didn't occur to me that this would probably uh, resonate with network um, uh, uh, actor theory. Um, the problem is, um, you see the temporality of it. It's not reversible. That is, um, what happened in no November, uh, October, November of uh, 1950, uh, within that week, it was not reversible. Um, and so that's the politics of it. And it cannot be captured by a network. That's, that's why even though I, I love this image, I just find it um, doesn't quite capture it. The movement and the struggle is the struggle, the collision, the negativity. I sound like Hegelian, but, but I'd rather be a Hegelian than a Latourian. <laughs> so it, it's really the struggle that is going on. I'm very interested. There are unexpected things happening there. And it just happened that India sent some two women. It just happened. It could, may never have happened, right? So all of these contingencies are, are also part of it, which cannot be predicted from network theory. So 
Okay, so um, you see what I'm getting, what I'm getting at? Uh, I don't know if I agree, but I think so. You wouldn't agree? So, um, so then how, how would you? No, I mean, uh, uh, predict uh, this kind of contingency, would it? Uh, so if I wanted to uh, capture the struggle itself, uh, it, it was very intense, the struggle. So uh, how do you then uh, think about um, concept making through struggle? Uh, be because um, what I'm uh, pushing against is genealogy and etymology, that is the positivity of words as the indexes of concepts, then that writes out struggles, moments of politics. So this, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get at. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does sound much more like Koselic than the Torah. Koselic. No, Koselic, I'm critiquing him. Koselic confuses <laughs> word with concept because you know he has been criticized for this. He doesn't, I mean, he has certain privileged words which serve as concepts, but he does not draw a distinction between word and concept. There's a logical incoherence in his argument. Won't you agree? Uh, well, we have to look and see what it's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm pushing back on Kosalek because, because uh, if, if you give me like time, <coughs> is some. Uh, we can talk about it later. We can talk about that, this later because but you're asking the right question, you know, exactly uh, how do we uh, think about this. But, but I, 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 I like this discussion because usually people just don't talk about that distinction, word and concept, and then just, just say, let's do keywords, which is the most boring thing and unimaginative uh, approach, uh, uh, keyword, so as if these words can help you along because they're positive. What about silences? Silences um, that are not spoken, words are not there, pure negativity, what about uh, negativity? And then I, I think the moment that I was demonstrating was negativity, which Sam Moyne didn't catch because he was following presence. engrams. Yes. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I, I, I'm struggling to formulate this, but I'm, I'm very interested in this. So um, you're, you're saying that you're talking about human rights as a concept. Um, are you, is that, am I getting that right to begin with? Sorry? You're, you are saying that you're talking about human rights as a concept. No, I'm, I'm talking about the discursive that's what I structure thought. That's as That's what I thought, concept. okay, okay. So yes. that's what I was getting a lost because it doesn't yeah, yeah, sound yeah, yeah, like yeah. you are, okay. Because it sounds like you're talking about a constellation in some ways. And constellation, yes, I'm struggling with structure, structure. constellation, network, but, but, so uh, genealogy. You know, so but, but, it, but, but what, what I'm getting from it is, and, and this is also related to a, a pre-Cold War, his, a pre-World War II history, but a post-World War I history that I want to raise here. So let me see if I can get it out. So um, you are talking about a discursive st structure, that's clear. Um, I'm not happy with it, though. I uh, just call I, it. I, I, OK, all right. Um, I'm, I, I'm, 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 let's take that in brackets. I'm going sure. to say that um, I, I have not uh, made up my mind about what you have not met, yet made up your mind about, So, right? But, but what I'm curious about, right, is what Western designates here in some ways. Because, um, because when you say it's not Western, it's, it's clear that there's a treaty here and there's some, some, some kind of legal structure that comes out of this intense contestation and negotiation um, in which delegates from India and elsewhere come. And, and, and I actually very much liked your last talk at Political Concepts because I felt like that got at the heart of some of what you were doing more intensely. Uh, because it, it brought in uh, the a, a different uh, philosophical and and I felt if I'm remembering correctly a, a linguistic um, sort of negotiation to the table right I mean when you talked about Pichang uh, using certain ideas is in, the, in your last talk uh, the one concept that uh, he analyzed the one concept that he analyzed yeah, last yeah, that, time. That, yeah. that which I thought it was more philological it was more philological which I, which I thought was kind of brilliant because it really yeah. did. Um, um, demonstrate that. Here it's interesting because you're talking about Hansa Mehta and 
um, her adding um, a you know, human being to it, for instance. Um, but then again, I am interested in, in what Western designates. Because I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you that we can't just slice up the world and dismiss things, structures and, and ideas and because by calling them Western, right? But I'm not sure that her notion of the human being, given the educational structures in India at the time, when it was necessarily non-Western, right? So again, it's not. Oh no, no, no! That was not the argument. Okay, that was not. Okay, uh, she then was I'm missing something. changing the gender, the language. Her de the debate. The she actual, was changing the gender language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was, was uh, that was not the, the the question about a Western. This yeah. is the response to most people when they say, for instance, the Asian uh, values debate, yes. and they say human rights is a Western idea. We have nothing to do with it, and this has been going on for a long time. No, no, I know that, and I don't agree with the, right, with, right. with with the ways in which that's applied. But 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 then, what is Western doing there? And you're, are you saying it's not a Western idea? Or are you saying that that there, that different parts of the globe participated in an intense negotiation about what um, the legal structures in which the phrase might be used? That's what I'm not getting clear from the talk, right? Because it seems to me that there's a move back and forth between those two things. Um, because yes, self-determination comes out. Yes, they're pushing back against the colonies. But, but did you understand? Am I making myself clear? The, I, the, West, the West, this term comes up all the time, even in that debate. And also after uh, this whole thing. So it's with quotation marks. It's not my assessment. You know, this is Western. That is not. Yeah. I, so, 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 is is that what you are asking about? Uh, so, what when I'm when I'm saying what, what I'm responding to people uh, who say this is a, a Western document. Um, so, conditional on how people use this term. The West, it doesn't mean that I subscribe to a certain idea of the West and I, I know exactly where the boundaries are. It's a discursive uh, a history where people, you know, the West, you know, it's a very recent idea. Yeah. And so uh, the United Nations uh, is very much contested um, by, so uh, are you in suggesting that this is legal structure? Uh, is not native to a lot of these societies? No, I'm, not, I'm not actually there at all. I mean, what I, what I'm, I mean, it may not be, but it doesn't, I mean, I, I don't know what native means these days, right? I'm not saying that at all. What I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is, um, and, and I'm, maybe actually, to be more honest, what I'm suggesting, you might want to elaborate a little bit more, right, is, um, if, are you, it, it can sound like you're only saying that the other countries were involved in, and delegates from other countries were involved in rewriting the text of this thing, right? And that may not be the most um, effective response to those who just want to designate it Western. That's oh, okay. That, that was that was uh, probably I didn't make it clear. That was not my argument. I'm, I'm not showing. Oh, these people were also part of it. it this was uh, simply. Uh, well, the fact was that they were part of it, right? And then I, it was in the context of uh, of of the uh, American anthropological statement when they say an Indian, a Chinese. So that's where I brought it up um, because the American Anthropological Association simply assume that you know, people who sat on the Commission on Human Rights were white people. And they were speaking to these other people. And so it was in that limited context I bring up these other people. But I'm, I'm also showing that they are making substantial uh, conceptual transformations. And they're very much, without them, it would not have been the same. Yeah, so uh, it, it's, it's, I'm not making an identity sort of an argument that is because these people are there and therefore it's not a uh, Western document. No, 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 I'm saying these people were universalists, whereas people from Belgium and France, and they were cultural relativists. 
See? So that's the argument. So why is it that these uh, third world uh, delegates uh, uh, has such universalist aspirations, whereas uh, the, the, the colonial powers insisted on cultural relativism. Isn't that interesting? So uh, it's about the competing universals that Brent was talking about, and that is really a, a moment of opening for politics. So that was the argument. I'm not making an argument because of uh, their identity, and the, um, many of them were educated in the West, so-called the West, right? Many of them were educated in Europe, and, and PC John was uh, from Colombia. And so if you follow that logic, they are part of the West. That's not the, log that's not the logic that, that, that I'm proposing. Okay, Fali has a question, uh, and then maybe we'll go to Susan. We'll collect, because I know that's one of our... Th thank you, Lydia. You just answered one of my questions, which was trying to uh, rephrase Saidiya's question, because I was thinking of Charles Malik, who was a student of Heidegger and then a student of Whitehead, and a Catholic, and very much always a very pro-American, uh, politically in the, in the Cold War, anti-Arab nationalist, anti-Nasser. Uh, so, you know, the post-colonial critique would be, you know, basically what is the West, but you sort of, uh, you answered it now uh, in sort of like rephrasing uh, his ideas, sort of like answering his ideas. But my main question was, you asked the question of, you know, so you gave us the discursive making of, of uh, human rights, but if you remove from what does this entail philosophically to what does this entail uh, politically, then what kind of answer would you give? And what I have in mind is basically uh, the pragmatic effects that human rights produce when they're, when they're, when they're deployed, the pragmatics of human rights, as basically uh, a contraption that has a very strong power of subsumption without a need of translation as opposed to you know these uh, marxists who are always thinking about you know what is class here how do we define the conjuncture etc and there's something about human rights which is basically uh, which it, it's it's a frequent flyer concept and it's sort of like literally you know it's just like it's smooth it's slick people who deploy it when they deploy it they sort of do not get a sense of that they need to translate something, to Arabize it, to chi you know, chinif chinification of Marxism, which is where the Arabization of Marxism comes from. We were talking about that these people were Maoists. So I was wondering, you know, what does, what does this making of story tell us about the sort of pr pragmatic of effects politically of the sort of operations and deployment of human rights as a concept? Does it change anything? Oh yeah, uh, I did. We're collect, okay. because we're running Susan has one in the front. Is there, an, is there another one? Thank you. Mine, mine really does pick up on, on this one. Uh, uh, Maybe this will be uh, the last. Uh, no, we need more and more questions. For, but I, uh, what, I'm, what I'm thinking about, I mean, I'm looking at these two maps, and I think one of the problems for me is, uh, and I thought your clarification was excellent to Sadia's uh, question, but I'm worried about being satisfied with the ideas that words become concepts because of political struggles, because there is a kind kind of privileging of the concept, and I would call that a kind of subsumption of what then happens, because these two maps, when I look at these two maps, it could look very victorious that there's all those now black independent countries, but we know that the problems have just begun of post-colonialism, they aren't resolved by that. So I mean, my, my issue would be, or my question would be, don't you have to immediately almost, because you've shown how important the, polit the political struggles historically in specificities are in producing, with a lot of contingency, a decent notion of uh, universality, don't you immediately have to allow that to escape into words again to see how the concept covers over or subsumes so much or that's maps. problematic afterwards? Or maps. No, but no, I don't mean, no, I, I leave the map out. I was just saying I could see it in the map. Yeah. But the concept of self-determination is already then, as soon as it gets heralded, it becomes a problem, a political problem that people have to struggle, not only to have national self-determination, but also to, to be able to eliminate their understanding of politics as being bound up with the necessity of being subsumed under a nation. That was under the rubric of the United Nations, and the state is the protagonist. That is, that's the problem. 
Yeah, it's the uh, international uh, legal order. But, now I, but I know, no, but I'm trying to now get you uh, to think uh, about, like, you have to know that I'm against concepts totally. I want concepts You're totally thrown away. All I don't want the, all concepts. Concepts are, are subsumption machines. <laughs> and what they do is take away the particularity, the way, in fact, a word, as you so beautifully showed, absorbs the historical particularity of its coming into articulation? Well, um, the map might uh, uh, look triumphant <laughs> in, that, in that moment, right? Within that moment to demonstrate uh, what self-determination was doing. But yes, many problems uh, appeared not because, I mean, there are all kinds of, uh, um, issues uh, relating to like so-called failed states and it doesn't mean that because they became independent but what I'm trying to show is 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 that um, under the rubric of the of the United Nations and this is what they achieved it's not that I subscribe to you know you know human rights uh, as a concept, and so this is related to, to your question, what did it accomplish? It did accomplish something, as I said, um, because they pushed back and they, uh, they were criticized by Marxists back then. And at Bandung, Zhou Enlai resisted human, human rights. And he didn't want it to be written into the, uh, into the f uh, final communique. Yes, there, there was this. Um, but it, in, in its own time, it was a very much contested uh, political moment revolving around creating uh, and transformation of some ideas. So this is what I'm, it's not that I think it's a wonderful idea, human rights as opposed to class struggle. And um, it's always, kind of, and it's changed. I think Sam, right, uh, Sam, Sam Moy was right uh, in the one sense that after 77, the United States became part of foreign policy. Yeah, which, which means, which means it, it again got transformed. The word itself has been inserted into other structures, you know, in, in incorporated into other discursive structures. And it's not what it was doing uh, you know, back in the 40s. So, Susan, if you're against concepts, are you against words as well? No, because I think that you showed us so well that the words actually absorbed, uh, this is the way I would talk about it, they absorbed the historical particulars. They, they, they're in that word. You've shown us that these words are actually expressions of historical material uh, materiality you've shown us that but to me the the word word <laughs> captures that better than the word concept but it, it maybe it's just a small point but I, no, I, no 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 it's not a small point the, the, there's a word for concept there's a word for word and we confuse them all the time and there's a concept for concept and there's a concept for word as well. So we're dealing with <laughs> fourfold. We're dealing with some very complicated uh, uh, relations here. Um, relations is, um, and if we get out of it, because words do not mo mo monopolize concepts. We have lines, for example, with, you know, other kinds of visual configurations that are not words that are also conceptual. Music also can be conceptual. Not all music, but... Um, so there are other kinds of possibilities, but with words, it seems to be the dominant relationship to concept. There's a special relationship between word and concept. Okay, I think with that undeniably true statement. <laughs> uh, thank you and thank everyone today. It's been a great day. Thank you. That was so great. Some real discussions. Very exciting. So we're officially at the end of the of the the day, the program. Um, it's been a long day. I certainly am looking forward to uh, uh, carrying it on uh, with a drink in another setting. 
but if anyone does have the will or the interest for anything from two minutes to, uh, you know, more, uh, we sh I feel like we should, I mean, Brent gave us such a good start at the end of the last panel in terms of, I don't want to stand in front of you, Lydia, I'm sorry. <laughs> In terms, of, in terms of starting to, to, to think about connections and, and, and bigger issues. So I just guess I want to give the opportunity to anyone, not to keep anyone here longer. David's code is already on. <laughs> uh, don't do it for my benefit. Uh, but if there's anyone who has a favorite, I, I was just struck when Brent said, like, that's what I'm taking away. If they're takeaways, favorite quotes from your notebook, favorite things to think about, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just start for a minute by, by thinking of, uh, I mean, this, this idea of it seems simple and it seems like the, the obvious next move to get away from source and target, as Brent was saying, but I think the implications of that are, are, are pretty huge politically and uh, historically and epistemologically in all kinds of ways. So that's not nothing, as our friend Tony likes to say. That's a big something. But I also want to, uh, and that third, that, so I want to think for a second about this idea of like, are we do we know what we're talking about when we talk about translation? And I think that's so bound up with the possibility and impossibility, the translatable, the untranslatable. So to me, for better or for worse, and it might be semantic, that third space, that other thing you were talking about is precisely what I, you know, I'm more interested in saying translation, yes, as long as when we talk about that, we talk about this ongoing chain, this always, untran you know, that, that, that Cassin line of like, that we keep on not translating. So I wanna push against your kind of uh, Kayama's point at the end, like, hold on, but we think this is possible. And then you added hubris, and I'm like, no, of course it's possible. Like, there's, like, so I guess the question always is, uh, in terms of what metric would it be possible or impossible? Like, of course it's possible. You produced all these books. All these actors that we're talking about are engaged in this constant process of translation that is productive and historical and political and generative. Uh, back to Santos, maybe, you know, in any given moment, uh, this or that translation may be able to do more or less work or may be able to better do this versus that, but those are the kinds of questions. Like in a revolutionary situation, you know, speed and circulation is important. Other situations, like comparing notes is important. Other situations, you have the weight of the long history of the racialization of Haiti on your shoulder and you wanna, there's no getting it right, but you wanna do certain things. You don't wanna get certain things wrong, so I just, at the very least want to push away from this like, but we can still do it, right? I mean, all of these papers are showing that it's, it's doing and doing and doing and it, it, it's always doing. So I don't know what it would mean to, 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 I mean, I guess there are many ways to fail in some ways, or there are many bad effects, but there's no not translating, right? It's all, I mean, I guess I'll stop by just saying like, it struck me again in that point I made about uh, the constant chain, and I was thinking about what you were saying about the, the semantic, the porosity of a semantic network where other words, languages, concepts are, are always flowing in. And like any act of translation seems to be a weird reification where we freeze that giant process and like just take two little points of it and say, I'm interested in from here to here. So uh, I'll just, so to me, the part of the project is to kind of shift the meaning of translation. When we're talking about translation, we're talking about all these other things. But I don't know if anyone. That's my. That's some bourbon flow. Sure. Okay. That's the vote to shut it down and leave. Okay. Thank you, guys.